I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20 is our text for the day. Uh, And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then I'm going to encourage you to grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 72 and you'll be able to find Exodus 20 and follow along with us. Uh, let me also just say, if, um, uh, if you're at our Parker campus, the Bibles aren't in the seats around you. They're on the table in the back. And uh, if you'll just get up and grab one of those, you can uh, take one of those with you when you leave. By the way, at any of our campuses, at McCulloch campus or at Parker campus, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And uh, since I already mentioned uh, a hello to the Parker campus and to the McCulloch campus, let me just say this is our second weekend uh, of one church, three locations, seven worship services going on uh, over the course of a couple of days. Yeah. And it's exciting and it's crazy. And I'm just going to invite you guys to continue praying as we see what God does in these two communities where uh, we know there's thousands of people who need to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Most of us are here because God has changed our lives. And uh, some of us are here because we want God to change our lives. And all of us need it. So do our friends and neighbors. And so we're praying for them. Hey, we are studying the Ten Commandments. Because we want to learn how to keep our lives from crashing. That's why this series is called Guardrails, because we're talking about these, uh, these commandments that God gave to the, the Israelites in the Old Testament about 3,000 years ago or so, and, uh, and how they influence us today is by counseling us on how to live in the blessings of God to avoid our lives from crashing. And last week, as we introduced these, we also made the challenge that everyone would uh, learn the Ten Commandments And so we're just going to repeat them and and give them to you in that summary size that I think you guys can all learn. And, and, And when I say that, that means that when you guys are having dinner tonight or you're having lunch tomorrow or you're having, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, time with your friends, you go, Hey, how many do you know? Go ahead and call each other on that. Why not? But they go like this, you know, it starts off by God saying, Hey, I'm the Lord, your God who delivered you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols or graven images. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Number five is honor your father and your mother. Number six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. That's the 10. You guys can learn those. I know you can. It doesn't matter what campus you attend, what city you live in, uh, where you go uh, uh, to, to sleep at night. You can learn those 10 statements because those are the guardrails that God has given us to keep our lives from crashing. And so today we're looking at the second commandment, no idols. You should not make for yourself any graven images, any idols, and bow down to them and worship them. And uh, that seems really simple, doesn't it? Just seems really simple, especially if you're like me and you grew up attending an evangelical church. I grew up Southern Baptist, and so I was just taught, you can't have any idols like the Catholics have. Okay? I mean, that's what they told me. It's like, you know, they got statues all over the place. Those are idols. And I'm like, okay, those are idols. And then I met Catholics who love Jesus just like I did. And I went, um, they seem to love Jesus and be okay with that stuff. I'm not sure I understand this anymore. And then you read the actual text, and and you kind of go, um... This gets complicated. So let's look at the text. Let's dive into the complication. And let's talk about this this second commandment that's uh, designed by God to keep our lives from crashing. Beginning in verse 4. Exodus 20, verse 4. God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, what I hope to do today is simply answer three questions that jump out to me from the text. Questions that, as I sat and began to really study this, 
I, I said, I've got to answer these questions. I've got to figure out what is it that God's trying to say to us. And so I, I, I think these are maybe some of the questions that you might have as well. Because these are questions that when we answer them can protect our families and our lives from crashing. So here we go. First question is simply this. What is idolatry? What is idolatry? He says, don't make for yourself any graven images, any carved images. Don't practice idolatry. So if we're not supposed to make any idols, what in the world is idolatry? Anyway, it's a word we throw around. People have used it. Uh, and it didn't, I, you know, look, I grew up in church. I heard it all the time. Didn't understand it. I was like, well, I'm not, I don't have any statues. You know, can I have a piggy bank? Is that a statue? Uh, how does this work? So here's, here's the setting. The ancients uh, literally took wood and stone and carved images of, you know, animals and, and you know, things that they represented gods. They formed images in, out of gold and silver and precious metals. Uh, and then they'd set them up in a temple or in their house and they would worship it. They would pay homage to it. They'd offer sacrifices to it. As, as their form of worship. And they had household idols, and they had all these kinds of things. And so it's easy for us to dismiss because we're not so primitive. Does this command really even apply to us? So what is idolatry, and how, is it, how does it intersect with our lives? Well, first of all, idolatry is creating something to represent God. Something to represent God. So they made birds, they made, you know, uh, animals, they made trees, they made all kinds of stuff to represent God's. Uh, that they worshiped, but God doesn't want representations. He wants relationship. Think about that. He doesn't want a re representation. He wants relationship. In John chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a woman, and he says, God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. He's like, I don't want you to make idols. I don't want you to make images. I don't want you to make representations. I want to have a relationship with you. And just like you, you know, maybe, I hope you don't talk to pictures. That would be weird. You got a picture of someone. Well, I'm going to talk to that picture. Instead of like walking into the other room and talking to them. Right? Now, it's not the same because you now you can FaceTime. You can, you know, pull up the phone. You can talk to them face to face. That's not what I'm talking about. But if your spouse was in the other room, would you talk to their picture in, your, in, in the room you're in? No, you wouldn't. You'd get up and go walk in there. He, and that God wants relationship. He doesn't want representation. And that means if the crucifix or the cross represents God to you, then it's an idol. And that means if the statue or the building represents God to you, then it's idolatry. Even if the Bible represents God to you, it's idolatry. Look, I value this book. I, I, I want to learn from it. But I, I, you know, as a child, I got smacked if we just set it on the floor, you know, because it was in the way of the seat. Don't, don't treat your Bible like that. And, and, and so if, if there's anything that represents God to us, then it's idolatry. So uh, if that cross in your pocket becomes your lucky charm, it's an idol. So first of all, uh, idolatry is creating something to represent God. And then idolatry is loving anything as much as Jesus. Loving anything as much as Jesus. Uh, Jesus said, the great commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay, he went on to say that and love your neighbors yourself summarizes all of the Ten Commandments. All of the Law and the Prophets hang on those two. He said, you got to love Jesus with everything. you got to love God with everything. Now, most of you in here love Jesus. I know that. But do you love Jesus more? Than you love your family, more than you love your spouse, more than you love your children. <laughs> Here's a tough one for a lot of you, more than you love your grandchildren. See, we, you know, we can kind of go, well, does God really expect me to? Yes, he does. In fact, Jesus actually said, unless you love me more than you love mother or father or husband or wife or son or daughter, uh, you're not worthy of me. I know you love Jesus, but you love Jesus more than your club or your social group or your team. Do you love Jesus more than you love your country? There's a lot of people who go, God and country. Okay, as long as you have those in order and not as equals, that's true. Do you love Jesus more than you love your country? Do you love Jesus more than you love your reputation? At some point, it's going to cost you your reputation to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus said that all the time when he was teaching over and over and over again. The apostles said it in their writings. If you read the New Testament, you'll see it. You can't miss it. 
So at some point, people are going to say things about you because you're a follower of Jesus. And you're going to have to choose. Do I love Jesus or do I want my reputation to be good in the eyes of men? Do you love Jesus more than you love your money? Well, of course we do. Really, that's why we're so liberal in giving it to the church to be used in the name of Jesus, right? Or that's why uh, we really believe in our heart of hearts that if we won the lottery, it would make life better than just following Jesus without winning the lottery. See, uh, idolatry is when we love anything as much as we love Jesus. And then idolatry is worshiping God and anything. Anything else at all. See, God demands our undivided affection. The sin of idolatry was oftentimes trying to cover all the bases. So the Israelites never stopped worshiping God. Okay? They were always worshiping God. The problem was they didn't just stop at worshiping God. They also worshiped Baal and Asherah and Molech and, and these gods of these other countries that around them, the people groups, because they wanted to check all the boxes, cover all the bases. They wanted to be good with everything. And, and God said, that's not acceptable. I want you to worship me and me only. Not me and anyone else. So it is idolatrous before God for you and I to worship him and believe in horoscopes. Or palm reading or talking with the dead or, or collecting crystals or karma or anything else. If we are followers of Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and we believe that Jesus actually died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we have made a commitment with our lives to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, then he actually expects us to worship him and him only because we worship, we follow the living God, the God who delivered us from slavery, from death, and from hell. So we worship, follow, and serve Jesus only. Otherwise, it's idolatry. And we're breaking the second commandment. So that's the first question. What is idolatry? Second question, why is God jealous? Why is God jealous? Did you catch that? Because uh, verse 5 says, uh, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, I don't know about you, but this was always confusing to me because I grew up hearing, you know, that jealousy was bad. Not supposed to be jealous. And, 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 uh, and so when I read, or people read to me, that God was a jealous God, I was like, somebody explain that, and they just avoided it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It was kind of like it was a taboo subject, so you just kind of grew up with God's jealous. God says he's jealous, but I heard jealousy was bad. How does that work? Because God's perfect. Uh, so... This is why I think Scripture tells us that God is jealous. Why God tells us that he's a jealous God. Because God created us, God redeemed us, God adopted us, and God inhabits us. I mean, this is the story of Scripture. This is the story you're going to find in the Bible. You read it from beginning to end, and it goes like this. God made us in his image. That's Genesis 1, right? In the very beginning, there was nothing, and then God made the world, and then God made animals, and then God made us. And he said, I made you in my image. So there's that God image on us, but then we rebelled, we rejected God, we decided we're going to live life our way, not his way. And so that image was shattered, it was broken, it was damaged, and we deserved hell. And so God redeemed us. He sent Jesus to pay for our sins. That's what Jesus actually did when he died on the cross. He paid the price for your sins and my sins so that we could be redeemed, so that we could become uh, the children of God. And that means that God adopts us. The moment you confess Jesus is Lord, you are adopted into the family of God. You become sons and daughters of God. You become co-heirs with Christ. I know a lot of times we don't think about that. That means you're an equal inheritor of all things God is giving us. We're, we're, we're not beggars. We're, we're co-heirs with Christ. That's incredible. So God adopted us as his children, and then God inhabits us. So you confess Jesus as Lord, and God the Holy Spirit took up residence in your life, in your being. Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you and he is speaking to you and he's teaching you and he's comforting you and he's convicting you of sin and, and he's the reason that I don't need to tell you how to live because if you're a follower of Jesus, you got Jesus in you and he's going to tell you how to live. 
Okay? I mean, that's, you read the Bible and he'll, the words will jump out because the Spirit will go, hey, pay attention to that. That's why we want you to read the Bible. Because you read the Bible and God will mess with you. If you're his follower, if you're not his follower, he's just like, it's words, it's nice, it's a story, it's myth, whatever. But no, it's, it's, it's the Word of God. But you, you know, the, the Holy Spirit's in you. He's inhabiting you, which means he's doing all those things I said and he's guaranteeing your salvation until the day that you see Jesus face to face. And God did all of that for us. God did all of that for you. Isn't that amazing? And so what do we do in return? We ignore him. We complain about how he hasn't blessed us enough. We whine about how difficult life is, even though Jesus died so that he could be redeemed. We're ungrateful. We pursue other pleasures. We worship other gods. And God is jealous. In other words, we reject his wisdom and his love. So bluntly put, this is how scripture puts it. Uh, idolatry is cheating on Jesus. That's what idolatry really is. It's cheating on Jesus. Now, if you read the Old Testament, there's this imagery that is repeated over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, I already mentioned that, that the Israelites worship these other gods. Right? They worship God, but they also worship Baal, and they also worship Molech, and they also worship Asherah, and they also worship, the, you know, the, all these different gods of the nations. And because uh, they thought they were cool gods, or they might bless them somehow, or whatever. And, uh, and so the, the imagery was this. God kind of said, hey, uh, Israel is my wife. Judah, the nation of Judah and Israel, the, the two nations that were side by side, as, as, you know, once were one and they split. You're, you're like my wife, and, and when you're worshiping these other gods, you're unfaithful to me. And he used really strong language, because basically he called them whores. See, some of you think that the Bible's kind of like PG. It's not. There are actually books in the Bible that women and children are not allowed to read. You want me to tell you which ones? Yeah, see, some of you are, yeah, the book of Ezekiel, uh, women and children were not allowed to read Ezekiel. They were not allowed to hear it read. Uh, in fact, Ezekiel 23 is like the epitome chapter of conviction where God is just fed up with Israel and, and he accuses her of being a whore over and over and over again and describes it in graphic detail. And some of you I know now are going to go home and read Ezekiel 23. Some of you are already flipping to it because you have your phones and you're like, I can read this now. It sounds more interesting than the sermon anyway. <laughs> and it's a sad statement of cheating on God, unfaithfulness. So let me bring this to us. We're the bride of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, that means you are part of the bride of Christ. There is a love relationship between Jesus and his bride, and he wants us to be faithful to him. And, and when we flirt with other gods, with other philosophies, with other uh, you know, ways of living, if we delight in the, the pleasures of this world rather than in Jesus, we are being unfaithful to our Savior. And sometimes we're like, yeah, we know, but we're saved by grace. And we know the grace of God. He's going to forgive us because he's a forgiving God and we're going to mess up. But it, it's not that big a deal. All right, let me just put it in the same vein as God puts it in Scripture over and over and over again. Men, how many of you would be upset if your wife had a boyfriend? Okay, some of you guys didn't raise your hands very quickly. We need to have some marriage counseling later on. Ladies, would it be okay with you if your husband had a girlfriend? Even if, wait, wait, ladies, even if he promised to love you more? Still not okay. Yeah. Why? Because we're, we're, we're a little bit jealous. We'd be a little bit jealous. We wouldn't want to, you know, share in that way. Guess what? This is how God feels about us. This is how God feels about you. 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 Yeah, he's looking at you, and, and he sees your life, and he wants your absolute faithfulness to him. And when you're flirting with these other gods, with the, and you say, I, I'm not flirting with any other gods. Yeah, any other philosophies about how to live? Because he's told you how he wants you to live. It's why we want you to read the Bible. And, and, and you go, yeah, but I, I think this is more important, or I think this is a better way than God's way. Then, then you're flirting with other gods, and, and you're being unfaithful. 
And if we are serious about loving Jesus, then we will repent of being spiritual whores and we will worship Jesus and him only. And we will follow Jesus and him only. Because idolatry is cheating on God. That's why God's jealous. He made you. He loves you. He redeemed you. He wants you to himself. Third question. Why does God punish the children? I'm pretty sure this made you uncomfortable too. I don't like it even when I read it now. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Why does God punish the children? I don't like that. It doesn't seem fair. I mean, really, honestly, the question is, why does God punish the kids for having stupid parents? And then it dawned on me. Actually, God revealed it to me uh, as I agonized over this. God isn't actively doing anything to actually punish the kids. He, he really isn't actively doing anything. This is what happens in the world that he created. It's how life works, and we all understand this. If you live long enough, eventually you understand that we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul says it as bluntly as it can be said. He said, do not be deceived God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. If he sows to the Spirit, he will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That's kind of black and white, isn't it? That's kind of what God's telling us. Hey, you're, you're going to reap what you sow. It doesn't matter uh, if, if you try to avoid it, you try to cheat it, you try to get around it. It's going to happen. Uh, it's, it's how he made the world. So it's a reality. So God's part in punishing children is allowing stupid people to have children. Okay, if you don't like the word stupid, it's not acceptable in your family, that's okay. Just, uh, you know, put in the word rebellious or defiant or evil. They all fit. Let me put it uh, a little more practical way, maybe. Family curses and family blessings are real. Family curses and family blessings are real. Um, it, if you just go to the, the secular social science research, it, it tells us that many of the destructive habits and traits are passed from parents to children. Okay, just uh, I did a, a cursory look at some of the big problems plaguing the world today. Here's, here's the statistics from this week. In alcoholism, children of alcoholics are four times more likely to become alcoholics themselves or, get this, to marry alcoholics and be abused. If you're an alcoholic, then your kids are four times more likely to be alcoholics than other people's kids. Why? Because family curses are real. Physical and sexual abuse. Those who are abused are more likely to abuse others. Doesn't make any sense at all, but it's consistent throughout history. Abusers don't, you know, they tend to abuse. How about drug abuse? 20% of teen addicts in treatment were introduced to drugs by their parents. That's just the teens that were actually in treatment. Known addicts and 20%, one in five kids that, that are addicted to drugs, were introduced to those drugs by their parents. Family curses are real. By the way, if, uh, if you're an addict, your kids are 50% more likely to become addicts. How about suicide? A lot of people go, well, you know, suicide, it's all about me, and it's, uh, you know, they, and, and the lie is this, they would be better off without me. Really, they would be better off without me. That is absolutely not true. Here's why. If you commit suicide, your kids are four to six times more likely to follow suit. That's a curse that you're passing down from generation to generation to generation. Family curses are real. So parents and grandparents, our actions, our choices, our idolatries are going to impact our children and our grandchildren. This isn't just about you and protecting your life. This is about the kids and protecting their lives. 
keeping their lives from crashing. Now I say that and remember this. God is able to redeem your life. God wants to change your life. The reason Calvary exists is so that we can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And so we know that God can change a life. We know that God can redeem a life. We tell the stories over and over and over again. So God wants to change your life. He wants to help you break those generational curses because that's what those are. And parents, I don't know if you noticed this, but we can also provide generational blessings as well. We have the ability to curse. We have the ability to bless. I know this from my own uh, family. My father was cursed by an illiterate, drunken, abusive dad. That was my grandfather. And my dad broke those curses. He graduated college and grad school, never touched a drop of alcohol, introduced his sons to Jesus, and lived a big part of his life helping people overcome addictions. He just took those curses on head on and challenged them and, and, and broke them because he wanted to bless rather than to curse. You see, we're not trapped by our past. We do not have to live in the identity of our past or our parents or our grandparents. Their choices, even our choices, can be redeemed because God makes all things new. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, old things pass away, all things become new. So don't let your past define you. If you follow Jesus, he gives you a new future. So that leads to the last question I'm going to ask you. What do you need to do to keep your family from crashing? What do you need to do? What's the Holy Spirit that you invited to be present here and present in your life? What do you need to do to keep your family from being destroyed. Let me get specific. What idols do you need to tear down? What destructive behaviors do you need to repent of and confess? What steps of healing do you need to take? Hey, uh, in Havasu, we've got Celebrate Recovery Monday nights at 6.30 at our McCulloch campus. Yeah, we've got some fans of Celebrate Recovery here because they know God has set them free. And there's some of you, actually, I, I see personally, I believe all of us need Celebrate Recovery. Because all of us need to learn how God can set us free. And, and uh, see, the people who are clapping already figured that out. The rest of us are like, well, I know I'm messed up, but I'm not messed up that bad. <laughs> Truth is, you are. You just don't know it yet. So uh, that's Mondays at 630. You got a lot of room for you there. Uh, maybe you're just like immediately right now. Struggling, you want to talk with someone, pray with someone, prayer teams are available at every single campus after the services. We've got counseling that we can hook you up with through the church. In other words, we want to help you break that curse and start over and bless your kids and bless your grandkids and see what God can do because Jesus is calling you. Are you going to follow him? Because some of you right now are tempted in your life to drive off the road and over a cliff and destroy your life. And some of you are at the bottom of the cliff and you're assessing the damage and you're trying to figure out what to do next and God is calling you because he wants to change your life. He wants to redeem your life. But that's going to happen if you listen to Jesus and if you follow Jesus. I hope we answered your questions. And I hope we gave you the encouragement to surrender completely to Jesus. Give him your absolute loyalty and throw out your household idols. Let's pray. Father, thanks for loving us. We don't deserve your love, and we know that. And so we welcome your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness that is not dependent upon our goodness or our keeping the commandments, but is dependent on us relying on Jesus. And so we simply invite you to speak into our hearts, into our lives. Let us hear your voice clearly. And God, give us the courage to surrender to you. To you alone do we want to, to yield our lives. To you alone do we want to offer up our worship and our praise. To you alone do we want to be followers of. So right now we tell you that we love you. 
We thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us life in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.